Hi guys, greetings from sunny Southern California. My name's Kevin Savigar. I'm a musician, producer, songwriter, and uh, have been doing this uh, for quite a number of years. Um, Mark very nicely asked me to uh, answer a few questions. So he sent me uh, four questions that I'm going to attempt to answer um, for his workshop. Hope you're all having a great day there. And I hope uh, some of this information might come in handy. First question. You've been a successful writer and producer for a long time. Can you talk about the changes you've seen over the years in production? For instance, how did you go about producing Rod's last record as opposed to your process in years past? Well, I started back in the steam-powered days of recording, analog tape, big expensive studios, and lots of live musicians playing at the same time. Uh, to be able to record was a luxury as you had to have a pretty sizable budget to do it and the logistics of getting it all organized was was hard you, you had to you know get everybody's schedules together and show up at the same place at the same time um, when we made records with rod in those days uh, we'd typically uh, book a big block of time like a month lockout for about eighteen hundred to two thousand dollars a day lockout was great as you just left all the instruments set up and the mics and you just showed up every day for work and everything was as you left it so you could just really make the record as you go along and nothing changes day to day uh, you don't have to tear down or anything like that but it's a really expensive way to make a record and uh, you know it, it ends up being a, your clubhouse basically for your gang uh, but that's a whole other story. We won't go into that here. Uh, so at the end of the day, the budget was typically between six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars, which was a lot of money, and uh, you had to sell a lot of records to uh, cover your costs. Uh, yes, sales were higher back then for a lot of artists uh, when that was the model. Uh, but the games changed a lot. Sales are nowhere near to where they used to be, and so you. Look for more ways to make records more economically nowadays. Um, the last Rod album that came out in October we, we produced um, is called Another Country. Uh, I made it on my laptop, simple setup, MacBook Pro running Logic with a lot of plugins and a couple of really good mics um, and a Universal Apollo twin interface just to get the audio in. And I even used the internal preamps and everything sounded fine. We typically would set up in the library of his house here in Los Angeles or uh, in Palm Beach, he has a place there, or in London. So it was important for me to have a portable setup as well so I could just throw everything in a bag and hop on a plane and go record him. Um, we built the tracks, bringing in players as we needed them. You know, we were writing the album as we went along. Uh, so we'd start with the bare bones of a song using loops and stuff and uh, go from there. Also it meant we could change the arrangements of the songs, adding bits and pieces on the fly as the song evolved. So that was a really nice fluid way to work. Um, I'd then bring the tracks back to my studio here at home and uh, mix the album here. Uh, then we took it to Bernie Grunman to master it here in uh, Hollywood. And, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was a great experience because for a, a, a relatively low budget record made very simply on a laptop, we had six top ten singles in Europe come out of it. So it was, you know, it was, it was a, a, a good experiment. Uh, so the budget was manageable. We had the freedom to experiment without watching the clock. And that was nice. We could change anything at any given time. Pretty cool compared to the old days when we'd have to recut songs because they'd be in the wrong key. Uh, and just hope we could get the magic take. We ended up, I think we cut Forever Young in eight, seven different keys. So we get a phone call in the morning, say, oh, we're going to try an E-flat today. It's like, oh, no, E-flat, I hate E-flat. But, uh, yeah, so that was the old days. You'd have to, like, go back to square one and start it. We kept the drum take, but they're overdubbed to the drum take. But now it's great. You can just change change things really easily. Um, it's nice being able to work around our own schedules, too, not being in a commercial studio where you're paying for time. So it's definitely a more pleasant experience for us now making records than it was back in the old days. That's the basic. Okay, question number two. 
some of the writers out there are also aspiring artists, what would you tell them to look for in a producer? Well, I'm guessing there's a pretty broad spectrum of songwriters in your audience today covering a lot of ground, from, say, country singer-songwriters to pop top liners to track producers, composers. Um, I always think the smartest way to go is to find a producer who can bring a lot to the party and do a lot of the stuff that may not be your strongest suit, uh, whether it's, you know, suggestions of lyric changes or arrangement changes or somebody who's an engineer if you don't do tracks, or somebody who has some engineering skills, uh, or a pro programmer um, if you're um, basically uh, essentially a singer. Um, so, you know, just find somebody that doesn't do what you do and then team up with them. I think that's always a good starting point to, in what to look for in a producer. Um, had the good fortune to work with a lot of major producers over the years, uh, people like Bob Ezrin, who did Pink Floyd, and Trevor Horn, who's one of the greatest producers, uh, Bernard Edwards from Chic, and uh, and the great Tom Dowd, who did all the early Aretha Franklin stuff. He uh, he came in and made a few early records with, with us uh, back in the uh, early 80s. And the common thread I noticed with all these legendary guys was always, they always knew when to make a suggestion, either an arrangement change, if the song needs a bridge, a lyric change, if there's a dodgy line in there, all kinds of things, as well as being, you know, a good coach and cheerleader, which is important, keep the morale going, keep the session moving, flowing. Um, but they also knew when not to make a suggestion, which is just as important, and when to let it breathe naturally, when to let the artist um, have a little time to work things out. So it's a bit of a dance, you know, back and forth. Personality is a major factor as you'll be spending a good bit of time together. Uh, you want to find a producer who's able to share your vision of how you see your music and take it to the next level. Um, like I mentioned in the previous question, technology has pretty much changed everything. Everyone can have a studio in their laptop now, so you don't need to spend a lot of money on studio time these days. If the song is there and you have the right chemistry with the producer, that's the most important thing. But uh, I think really seeking out somebody who can help you in areas where you may need help is, is, a, is a really good place to start. Okay. Question number three. Along with your other jobs, you're also a publisher. How would you advise a songwriter to record a pitchable demo? How fleshed out does the song need to be? Um, well, it all depends on the song. Big hits have been pitched as simple guitar vocal work tapes. Um, I know in Nashville that um, you know this has happened a lot, uh, but it's really not the norm these days. There, there's no rules to it, obviously, but I think most often you'd want to present the song so it sounds as close to a final record as possible to give uh, whoever you're pitching it to, whether it's the artist, the management, the record label, uh, a, a pretty clear vision of, of what the records could sound like. Now, if you have a hit song, I think you want to make the chorus sound like a hit. Uh, and our people sit in their offices every day listening to a lot of demos. So the competition to make your song stand out and be special is pretty fierce. So you have to do everything you can to present it the best way possible. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of making, you know, making the master, not the demo, just, just really trying to make a nice three and a half minute record of your song. Um, and of course, with the technology available now, um, you can take your time till you get it there. And finally, question number four. So many current hits are production driven, even to the point of programmers being called producers and even co-writers. Is there a difference between a great song and a great record? Uh, well, as I mentioned, technology has changed the way a lot of songs are written today. Uh, track producer writers now often get the ball rolling with a track, uh, you know, coming first, and the top line, the lyric and melody, you know, coming after that, often times inspired by the where the track goes, and the emotion the track conveys. Um, there's so many hits out there now that are driven by a sound or a riff, and I couldn't tell you what the lyrics are half the time. And often when you read them online, you wish you hadn't. Um, can be a little disappointing. Uh, Coldplay's Adventure of a Lifetime, I love that record, uh, that comes to mind. Uh, the synth riff that happens in the hook, 
against the bass and drums sells the song for me. Uh, absolutely no idea what Chris Martin's singing about, and it isn't really important. The feeling I get from the track makes me very happy indeed. Um, so there's that. Then there's the songs that completely slay you with the lyrics. So many incredible and clever country songs. Uh, Humble and Kind comes to mind by Tim McGraw, recent number one song. Um, and songs like you know, Paul McCartney's Maybe I'm Amazed that just take you on a wonderful three and a half minute, four minute journey. Um, there's room for it all. So I think to answer your question, is there a difference between a great song and a great record? I think we're all just trying to capture some magic that lets you escape for a few minutes and make you feel something, whether it's pure joy, heartbreak, make you dance or cry. If you can marry a great song with a great record, then I think you've got it figured out. Hope some of this info is helpful. And have a great rest of your day at Mark's Workshop. See ya.